So um, our title for the program today is Balancing Reduced Emissions with Aesthetic and Environmental Expectations. And our very special guest speaker is our good friend and colleague for many, many years, Dr. Frank Rossi, who is the State Turfgrass Extension Specialist headquartered in Ithaca, New York. But Frank is international. He's all over the world, literally, talks at conferences, does lots of different types of research on turf grass. Um, and he's interested in golf, as well as lawn care, as well as sports fields. And he's very interested in how turf grass and the environment interact and how we can make things better. So he's somebody that I have a lot of respect for, and he does a tremendous amount of work and is one of those people that's always thinking way ahead. So thank you, Frank, for coming by. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> it's nice to be here. Always good to see you. Can you guys see my slides? Uh, yep, it's up. Okay, you can see it? Yeah, I can see it. Perfect. Rather than trying to get all those words that we had for the title on the slide, um, as I was putting it together, I thought I would just wander us through a topic that I honestly had to brush up myself on. Um, it wasn't something that uh, I generally think about, and I think it's an indication of how the consumer is beginning to demand these things, and the industry is adapting to that demand, um, and, and particularly in outdoor power equipment. So hopefully what I'm able to do is uh, wander us through this topic in a way that allows you to explore it further and understand um, as the changes evolve in how we power our lawn and garden equipment, uh, what this is going to mean for you as a consumer, as well as the commercial landscape industry uh, that takes care of our urban landscapes. So first off, we'll start with uh, April as National Lawn Care Month, in case anybody didn't know this. Um, and also that the thing I work uh, have to work with a lot is the negative perception that lawns get, a lot because of the way we've industrialized them. Um, but at the same time, if we throw them out because of the way we've treated them and get rid of them as a landscape option, like many people might prefer, I think you're going to see a much bigger harm to the urban environment than just having something, you know, close cut that's simple and easy to care for. The more complex these urban landscapes get, the more maintenance that they need, uh, even for the consumer. And we found that most of the time, professionals and consumers generally are not up to the task and either they become over-industrialized or completely neglected. And both of those are really bad things. So looking at lawns for their functional benefit uh, as a climate change uh, solution, I know seems very odd to you, uh, especially with the topic that we're talking about here. So let me keep this moving. So GLGE is the, um, uh, is, the gas, let me make sure I got this right, David. Hold on a second. I got this in the wrong spot. There we go. All right. Now I'm better. I didn't <laughs> want to start out with that slide. Now I'm better. Okay. So I'm a scientist, love data. I found data. So I'm going to go with this data. This is a EPA study uh, done out of, Mass out of the Massachusetts region, out of Ma Massachusetts office. Um, National emissions from lawn and garden equipment. So GLGE, gas-powered lawn and garden equipment. Okay? Gas-powered lawn and garden equipment. The population of gas-powered lawn and garden equipment in 2011 was 120 million known implements. 40% of them are mowers. 18% trimmers, edgers, brush cutters. 14% would be tractors, ride-on mowers, uh, tractors that might not be related to mowers, leaf blowers and vacuum, less than 10% in 2011, chainsaw snow blowers, and then 7% other. So when we're addressing emissions in powered equipment, 
lawn mowers and line trimmers make up more than half of all the equipment. Leaf blowers, on the other hand, have been a common target for regulations around their use, but make up a very small component overall. Now, in Bedford, right, right, David? In Westchester in, in, in County, it might make up a greater percentage, but nationally, this is what it makes up. Yeah. Now, when you look at the emissions, like when we say emissions, this was a big learning for me. I mean, I honestly, <laughs> candidly, didn't have not paid a lot of attention to this, other than saying we should use these things less. When you look at volatile organic carbons, the VOCs, the nitrous oxide, the carbon monoxide, and the PM, let me get my pen here, the PM10 and PM25 is fine particle particulate matter, right? So you look at the percentage of overall emissions associated with gas-powered lawn and garden equipment as a percentage of all the emissions, right? Volatile organic carbon, NOx, carbon monoxide quite a bit higher. And in the overall, what it contributes to particulate matter Overall, very low. But as soon as you start to look at off-road or non-road emissions, you see enormous uh, contributions of this. Oh, my goodness. So something's happening here. So, uh, uh, sirens are going off. I'm sure it's a test. So hopefully <laughs> nothing's happening. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yes, it is, in fact, a test. So you'll have to put up with this in the background. For now, the thing to understand is when you say emissions, it's not necessarily just greenhouse gases, right? Carbon monoxide and nitrous oxide and volatile organic carbons. When we say greenhouse gases, this is what we mean. When we mean like dust and stuff that gets emitted into the air that we potentially breathe, it looks like we do a lot of this, you know, 35% of it or more. Um, from gas power, lawn and garden equipment, right? When you think about this line, this is a pretty significant contribution. Overall, not much to overall emissions, but to non-road emissions, large percentages. Most of the non-road emissions, things that aren't associated with power equipment on the road, 40% of it comes from lawn and garden equipment. So it is obviously an area that, that we need to be smarter about. Now, I thought from the same study is worth noting. New York's on the list. We are one of the four states in America that contribute to 25% of the overall uh, emissions in these various areas mm. associated with gas-powered lawn and garden equipment, right? Florida, you know, obviously Florida and California with enormously long growing seasons. Right. And this from a from a national perspective is a big deal because I don't know if you're paying attention to this, but we're building houses and residences like crazy in the southern states. The pressure to continue to have these landscapes to manage in southern states with long growing seasons is going to go up. So obviously there's growing concern that some of these states and you see California, which has been very aggressive and assertive in restricting these things. Florida, on the other hand, not that interested in restricting too many things in Florida. Uh, and this is an industry that Florida uh, really relies upon. In There's other studies. In this study, it actually goes through the labor force and what the workforce is, is associated with these things. And no surprise, again, Florida, California, and Texas, large landscape labor forces because, of course, the length of the growing seasons. Okay, so that's a technical way to look at this, right? In a more trendy way to look at it, uh, where a place like Louisville, Kentucky, you will actually get a rebate. If you turn in your gas-powered mower, you could potentially get a rebate if you buy a cordless electric or a plug-in electric mower uh, for your yard. And you can see, uh, based on EPA standards, you know, you're going from about 14 pounds of carbon 
Uh, again, this is just looking at the one aspect of carbon that's coming out versus three pounds versus 2.4 pounds, right? Plugging anything in is inherently, and using a battery is inherently going to lower most of these emissions. So there's no question about it when we're talking about emissions, uh, plugging in electric is going to solve a number of those problems. Now, one of the things I'm not going to get into intensively is the noise issue, because I know this also has components um, of it that many communities are addressing. But one of the things when you look at, and I think uh, the number here you want to pay attention to is 82 decibels, right? When you get above 82 decibels for a period of time, you're, you're touching the point where you need hearing protection. Mm. So you look at the horsepower of these mowers and the size of the decks. A lot of this work has been done uh, for commercial purposes by commercial mowers because of the exposure time right? Homeowners generally are going to be exposed to high decibels for doses under an hour and therefore are not generally considered to be critical. Most of the issues associated with noise are when the doses are over an hour long period of time. And in fact, most of the way these things are set up from a noise uh, pollution perspective and hearing protection perspective are based on eight hour doses. Right. And obviously there's big differences with the blade on and the blade off. And you can look at this study and encourage you to Google this study. You can read more about this particular experiment that was conducted by Briggs and Stratton, um, because a lot of the noise comes from the blade. Sometimes things rattle around that have nothing to do with just what's in the engine itself. So a very complicated issue and not one easily solved unless you necessarily go to pow uh, electric powered equipment, which will drive down the noise emissions. And I wasn't able to pull up too much about noise and um, electric equipment. Okay, so when I start talking about this, uh, I go to people who do this for a living and it's the outdoor power equipment industry, OPEI. This is the group of companies who make outdoor power equipment, who are trying to embrace zero emission equipment, right? And, and you can see in this case, look up at this example. Here you're looking at a battery operated um, chainsaw with a supplemental battery pack on the person's back. This is very common and something, not, not a chainsaw, this is a hedge trimmer. This is something very common that you see in commercial options because of the power demands and the length of time this is gonna run, right? This is a big uh, push in this industry. So let's go through the way they're promoting this. Now, first off, when you look at some of the things this industry puts out, you know, the power behind the power, but on the right, you can see these are the sort of, they're actually promoting powering your yard around taking care of your dogs. There's this thing called turfmutt.com. And oh, you should do this so that your pets have good yards to play in. It's, it's a very interesting promotional campaign that this industry has uh, embarked upon. Uh, and you can see the sort of mow, clip, trim, blow, right? All things we do with power. Um, and as you see earlier, embracing the, the battery equipment. So let's look at some numbers right from OEI, OPEI. So in 2021, the industry shipped 38 million outdoor power equipment products. 21 million were zero emissions. So clearly we're seeing... A, a big increase in these things. One of the things that the industry is talking about is there is not a one size fits all power option. They're also arguing that engine and fuel technologies uh, are getting closer to life cycle emissions similar to today's electric options. So you want to pay attention when they throw that word in there, life cycle emissions, which means they're accounting for the life cycle of an electric piece of equipment that has inherent energy burned in the production of the battery and 
things that are like, you know, you look at what's involved in an electric car from a life cycle perspective, there's this argument that, well, you got to burn a lot of fuel just to make that battery operated car. So you want to be careful when you see these things talked about. They're not saying that the actual emission from using it is lower, but the overall emission of the life cycle of that equipment might be lower. Okay, so that's a very interesting little caveat. Now, small engines, which are getting the most heat, they're right now going through the third stage of EPA regulations. And they're pretty much, they're saying that it's 90% lower than pre-regulation levels. Okay, well, that means we were spewing crap for a long time and now we're 90% cleaner. And we hope that the 10% is still clean enough. What's really interesting is this last statement. Many products, including leaf blowers and lawnmowers, are certified well below EPA limits and not reflective of misleading comparisons, right? That one I did earlier, right? Remember this comparison, this thing here? They're saying, well, you know, the engines aren't really like that anymore. They're much better, okay? I just want to know when you look around for this, this is the kind of stuff that the outdoor industry is saying. Now, one of the things everybody's agreeing on when you look at the percentage of electric equipment that's improving dramatically, you see that um, uh, chainsaws are going like crazy, uh, line trimmers and leaf blowers by far. Lawn mowers have been the slowest to see uh, uptake. Now, I think that's because there's still concern that performance isn't there, but we don't think that's the case any longer. So let's take on leaf blowers for a second. I've talked about this in the past, right? Again, many of the statistics that are used, one long, one hour of, you know, a four cycle engine is 300 miles LA to Vegas, one hour of a leaf blower, 1100 miles, right? Some of it is that the leaf blowers are typically two cycle engines and mowers are four cycle engines and two cycle engines that mix the gas and the fuel together are by far still the most emitting pieces of equipment that we use and, and, and a worthy target uh, of a lot of concerns. Now, one of the problems that the industry is gonna have is when communities start going out and create these arbitrary dates, and now in, in, in some places they're saying you can't do it on Monday, other places are, it's got to be between these hours. You know, this gets very difficult, not only to run a business, you know, even take care of your own home, but how do you enforce such things? Well, yeah, people running around writing tickets when somebody started their blower at 845 instead of 9 a.m. This stuff gets very, very difficult uh, to enforce. And you wonder if, if putting things in place like this are the best thing um, it certainly gets everybody's attention. And so let's start looking at the options that the modern landscape industry has uh, for leaf blowers. When you look at some of these ratings, again, by the outdoor power equipment, right, you, you can see that generally you can, you're anywhere from at electric handhelds between uh, 350 and 605 cubic feet per minute. So first it's the volume of air it moves, and then it's the speed at which the air moves. And you can see compared to the big behemoths, very, you know, much below, speed wise, it's pretty good, but these things just don't move a lot of air. But comparative to a handheld leaf blower or a backpack leaf blower, we're getting performance now in the range both for the amount of air and the speed at which that air moves. Now, again, if you set an OPI standard that, you know, you probably want to be moving at about 120 miles per hour maximum airspeed, you can see there are a variety of uh, battery operated blowers that perform above that. And there is an even greater number of blowers that move the right amount of air, right? So you can get performance in the blower space. But again, as a consumer, maybe you're running this thing for 15 minutes. As a commercial person, you're potentially running a blower for eight hours. 
So you now have to confront carrying multiple batteries and multiple charging stations. You know, when you start to adopt this on a golf course or on a park like Central Park or Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, where we do research, you have to have a wall of plugs and a wall of chargers to be able to power this equipment. Now you can say, well, what do you got to use blowers for? Well, we can get into the variety of things that have to happen. And certainly we want to minimize some of this use by keeping things off the pavement. But at the same time, there's always things that, that fall on the pavement and you don't want those things tracked into the house or blowing into the stormwater. So having functioning equipment here is a viable way of keeping the urban environment clean from a water quality perspective. Okay, so as I start to think about uh, powered equipment, I've been fortunate to be able to study a lot of battery powered equipment in the last bunch of years. And so I wanna go through lawn mowers a little bit and start with how this works, cause I'm a grass guy, how this works from a mowing perspective. Well, first off, when you look at how fast grass grows, right? And you look at how many clippings they produce in the course of a year, right? You look at mixes with ryegrass and fine fescue in them, and you can see they produce an enormous amount of clippings over the course of a year. Tall fescue grows a lot. Here's a rye, blue, fine fescue, predominantly fine fescue mix, but just a little bit of ryegrass and a little bit of bluegrass still makes it grow a lot. Kentucky bluegrass grows a fair amount. It isn't until you get to almost 100% fine fescues, which are these lynx fine fescues, no mo fine fescues, 85% fine fescues, that you get slower growing grasses. So first, if you wanna mow less, you gotta have a different grass. Then when you mow it, how often do you mow it? And how much do you remove every time you mow it? And what height are you mowing it at? So this is a research experiment done uh, at the University of Nebraska, looking at two mowing heights and four different removal strategies. One is the pretty standard mow every week, no matter what. One is mow and take off 50% of the tissue, which means if it's at three inches, that means I cut it when it's at six inches. If it's at two inches, means I cut it when it's at four inches. And then you've got the 25% removal and the famous one third rule removal here. And one of the things you notice quickly is independent of mowing height, whether you mow it at two inches or three inches, the more you take off at once, the faster it grows and the more you have to mow. So the clipping yield, when you're mowing off 50% of the tissue each time is dramatically greater than when you're mowing weekly, 25% removal or 33% removal, right? So first off, a lot, taking off a lot of tissue at once makes the grass grow faster, not slower. How many mows do you do using each of these strategies? Well, one of the upsides of 50% removal is you're only mowing six to seven times a year versus anywhere from, you know, 17 to 22 times a year. Okay, so the number of times you mow and the height that you mow at are also going to determine how often you mow. Now, when we put this all together, I'm going to skip in the interest of time here. I'm going to uh, skip to this paper and get to the summary because it's much more interesting. These researchers looked at what's the most effective way to mow the least amount. And they said, if you wanted to emit the least amount of carbon based on how much the soil accumulates, right? Right, tall fescue, turf type tall fescue, right? Turf type tall fescue 
mowed by the one third rule and returning the glass grass clippings holds on to the most soil carbon. If you want to degree, decrease mowing emissions, you want to plant a slow growing, in this case, bluegrass cultivar, mow by the one third rule, right? And return the grass clippings, right? Return the grass clippings. So a slower growing grass mowed at the one third rule is generally, generally going to require the least number of mowings. The way to do this in a crazy way as we approach no mow May is what we do at Cornell. Tall grass, less gas. We have a lot of un unmown areas that at first people hated and now they love them. We mow right along the edge of the pathway to make the students feel a little safer. And we mow pathways through a lot of these things. Some people have embraced the no mow in some of these pocket areas in their landscape. And again, it's a particular look that doesn't require a lot of mowing, but that's a pretty typical look for how no mow plantings work. If you really want to go crazy with this, you can uh, adopt the bee lawn approach, right? That, that's looking at various mowing frequencies, one to three times a month, once a month, zero to two times a season, a pollinator garden, never mowing. So mowing can be compatible with more pollinator friendly approaches if you mow less. If you're considering robotic mowers, we've also played around with this. There are new standards available for robotic mowers. We've done a fair amount of research in this area. And I'll end with this little tidbit from my colleagues in Italy who conducted an experiment and actually put this statement uh, in the research paper in Italy Mowing the grass is generally considered a weekend nuisance, whereas in other countries like the United States, the lawn care is often a pleasant exercise. So as an Italian myself, I can appreciate this. Couple of things that were interesting with how a lawn responded under an autonomous mower that we've developed charging boxes that can take them completely off the grid. You can put a solar panel up that's about Oh, it's about 24 by 36, and it will generally charge the mower for what it's needed. But a couple of things happen. Lawns get denser, there's more shoots per unit area, and the leaves get thinner because you're cutting them all the time. The other thing they noticed uh, uh, six months, uh, no, it is eight months after they started, is creeping weeds like clover and ground ivy increased dramatically when they put them under autonomous mowing because it allowed light to penetrate deeper into the canopy because the, the lawn is always kept at the same height. Now, there's a number of things, in, you know, there's so many things involved here that I don't want to get into, but essentially you look at the uh, energy consumption versus energy consumption for gas powered versus energy consumption for battery operator or autonomous mower, even when it only runs once one time per week is significantly less. So with that, David, sorry, I think I took most of the yakking time and I'm happy to take some questions. But as I looked at this, I think there's a lot of changes we're going to see. I'm sort of curious in doing more uh, around this and understanding it more. But I think the robotic mowers and the, pow the electric powered equipment are going to really, we're going to wonder, do our systems accommodate, accommodate the way this equipment is going to work in the future, right? The way we've sort of built our outdoor landscapes, urban landscapes to work now may not be the best thing if we're going to move to lower emissions and no emissions uh, outdoor equipment. There you go, David. That's what I got. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, um, we can have, thank you, Frank, first of all. I think that was really fantastic. And I loved all that information because it was a really great update. Uh, so if people want to type in the chat box, any questions, Marcy will keep an eye on that. I've got a couple of questions. <clears throat> 
I guess first off, I was thinking, I've been thinking, can commercial people really use this electric equipment or battery equipment? Is it really up to standard? And you're saying it is. The blowers are. So the blowers are. What about mowers? Like if, if I was going to buy a big mower, are they? how good are they at this moment? At this moment, they're fair at best. Mm. Um, Greenworks has been um, the biggest company getting involved in this. And what we've seen so far where it's the ride-on 48-inch mower, um, they're finding they're getting, you know, three to four hours of use. Um, and sometimes hills are problems. So I would give it right now outdoor uh, commercial equipment a B minus, okay. C plus, partially because there hasn't been a demand. Oh. Right? I think blow, you know, this is the blowers were actually demanded before mowers. Yeah. Um, and a commercial way. Now you'll see residents, residential equipment is getting more popular into the electric and battery. And that's why we're seeing more development of the, the smaller mowers for battery, David, because they only have to run for an hour. Right, right. Versus having to run for eight hours. Right. And if you're on the road as a commercial landscape crew, for example, you got to carry a bunch of battery. Like I told you, you need a whole charging apparatus to fuel the batteries that these things need to run in a commercial standard. Yeah. I'm going to ask Frank one other question and then we'll go to Marcy. Um, so I see mostly the manufacturers of the uh, battery operated stuff are different than my John Deere or my Toro or my Honda. Are those companies Toro, are they going to get into this? Do you know? Uh, the answer is yes. They're all getting into it, but they're at a distinct disadvantage. Mm. When you if, you, if you saw that little slide I had with the van and the battery operated mowers, one of the big things that happens is the companies that are best at building brushless electric motors are the ones building the mowers now. Yeah. So like Ego, is a Chinese brushless electric motor company mm. that hired engineers in outdoor power equipment to design mowers. Mm. So they're completely rethinking from scratch the way we cut and process clippings. One of the big challenges that Toro and John Deere and these companies are having is that they've always been reliant on the deck to be a certain size and shape and create turbulence. And these, and you'll notice they all have one blade. You look at Ego and Ryobi, they all got two blades. Hmm. So the way they're approaching it from a motor perspective versus a mower perspective is the reason these companies are um, getting ahead of the typical companies in the battery operated equipment. Yeah. So it's sort of like the Tesla effect. Tesla is, is way ahead of Ford, but Ford is trying to come back. It's exactly the same thing. Um, they're, you know, these companies in engineering terms, it's called path dependence. They're dependent on things working in a particular path and adjusting that is hard. Whereas if you're coming to it, from a completely different place, you completely reimagine it. And that's why you see companies like Ego, Ryobi leading the charge in this area and companies like DeWalt and Steel and Skill just a little bit behind, because but they're still better than Toro and John Deere and Lawn Boy yeah. because they're brushless motor companies first, which mm. is the key. Oh, that's interesting. It is interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to let Marcy ask Frank some questions okay. from the audience. And keep All typing right. them in there. Yeah, they're coming in. So first, Frank, just so you know, like several people said, like excellent presenter and uh, excellent information and topic. So that's nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> so now we're on down to here. So can you recommend a robot mower for a large lawn? Um, 
Uh, in the robotic mowing area, in the autonomous robotic mowing area, right now, I would say the gold standard internationally is the Husqvarna units. Husqvarna, that Swedish company, is probably the most advanced right now um, in, in large-scale autonomous mowing. We did a trial uh, about six years ago with um, RoboMo, which is the um, Zumba Roomba company, the iRobot company. We did it with a company called Works, W-O-R-X, which I think is still on the market, um, and Husqvarna. We had two Husqvarna units. We had four units. And in that trial with Consumer Reports, the Works unit actually performed the best but they don't make that works unit that we tested anymore. So what I've seen in evaluations from some of my colleagues is that the Husqvarna unit has made some improvements since then. And right now they look like the leader in the large lawn um, autonomous mower space. Can you clarify autonomous mower, what an autonomous mower is? Something that doesn't need somebody riding on it. Okay. <laughs> So you have autonomous mowers, and then you have RC mowers, remote control mowers. We have a lot of areas on campus that are sloped, that have, they are, they're autonomous in the sense that there's nobody on them, but they're run with a, a person with a remote control. So that's a different kind of autonomous. It's still remote control, but truly autonomous is set it and forget it. So it's just like the Roomba. It's just like the Roomba. Everybody, Everybody knows the Roomba. Everybody, yeah, everybody knows the Roomba. Does. That's what it is. Um, are resident electric mowers more capable push mowers? A battery operate. I have an Ego. I have a, I have the, uh, I bought an Ego a couple of years ago and I have found it works really good on my tall fescue lawn that I mow, uh, that I keep around three inches and I mow it every week. It runs for about 45 minutes to an hour on a charge. It maybe is a half an hour when the grass is really wet and tall. So sometimes it takes me a charge to do it when it's wet and tall. Um, and sometimes in the spring when it gets cold, uh, it also reduces battery performance a little bit, but overall, Ego and Ryobi are at the top of the battery operated mower business from my mind. And it falls off steep after that. Mm. If you, if, but here's what I'll tell you. If you got a 2000 square foot long, right? 2000 square feet, just about any, and you mow it weekly, just about every one of these mowers will work well. The larger the lawn, the thicker the grass, the, the, longer the walk, the, the more you want to pay attention to the top performers. Smaller lawns, less demanding conditions, just about any of them will work well. Okay. What will it take for our electric grid system to change to accommodate these changes? Hardly anything. This is the really funny thing about this. The grid has enormous capacity to plug in everything because of the efficiency, even if you're burning oil, even if you're burning fossil fuels to heat the, to create the energy, because of the efficiencies you get with electric power, uh, plugging everything in is uh, not as risky. You know, everybody's of course thinking about this. What happens if we plug all the cars? If you plug all the cars in the world in today, it only adds about 12% to the grid. Wow. Yeah. The bulk of the grid, the bulk of the grid is not in plugging stuff in. It's a whole bunch of other stuff. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, what about the environmental damage and carbon emissions involved in, involved in mining and transporting all the lithium, nickel, and cobalt needed for the electrical equipment? Do we have to, don't we have to consider the worldwide effect rather than just a local emissions? Listen. <laughs> if we okay here's the way i feel about this that's a valid point but what the f we got to do something <laughs> if you expect there to be no no uh 
you know, problems with any solution and you use that problem as a way of solving a different problem. Okay, listen, right now, the problem is we're spewing shit into the atmosphere, okay? Let's figure out how to solve that problem and then we'll get to the lithium and the, but listen, I'm 100% in agreement with this. This is not a free lunch. But when I listen to the smartest people trying to confront these issues, they all say the same thing. Yeah, we're aware of that. It's not pretty. We need more sources. It creates the same geopolitical stuff we got in Ukraine right now. I mean, it's not going to it's not going to solve every problem. But right now we need to stop spewing shit into the air. And that's going to be much better with these alternative equipments. Okay. I wish I had a better answer, but unfortunately, <laughs> that's the answer. <laughs> right. It's your answer. What's your advice for homeowners considering going electric? Uh, don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of it. Go to Consumer Reports and read up just like I do. Unbiased evaluations of mowers. They'll do a good job on the size of your yard. The Do you want to walk? Do you want it powered? You know, so you don't have to push it. Battery operated mowers have auto drive now. So don't be afraid of it is all I tell you. And then uh, look at how long it takes. Um, look at how long it takes uh, to figure out how long it takes to cut your yard and pick your mower based on your demand. Okay. Can you give us a few tidbits about reducing fertilization, which in my opinion, like bottled water is manufactured demand. What recommendations can you give us? 100%. Love that. It is totally manufactured demand. It's a cultural phenomenon. But here's what I'll tell you. If I can sell you a little bit of fertilizer in the spring to get your lawn dense and a little bit of seed to fill in the bare areas, I don't need 90 million pounds of pre-emergent herbicides. How about that? So if you don't care at all about the quality of your lawn and it's just something that you mow every week, and you're not going to use herbicides, then as long as the ground's covered and the soil's not moving and it allows for good infiltration and hydrate, you know, it, it provides everything you want it, no need for it. But what we can say is we have pretty good data that says one or two, one to two applications of nitrogen fertilizer per year is defensible. Most lawns won't leak out any nitrogen if it stays one or two applications that total around a pound, pound and a quarter per year, per thousand per year. So <laughs> it is manufactured demand. Your total focus should be on nitrogen. Stop soil nutrient testing because all it does is make you put on more fertilizer. Now Dave's gonna yell at me because <laughs> the first words out of his mouth are got a soil test. <laughs> you get soil tests and everybody does it and it we then we interpret it and we put fertilizer out. Most people only need nitrogen and most of them it's the old Michael Palin. Michael, you know the food guy who wrote the omnivore's dilemma, you know, eat less, more plants, mostly plants, not much that three thing. Feed less, mow less diversify. <laughs> Can you recommend a no grow grass seed brand or source? Not particularly, but all the no mows are almost entirely fine leaf fescues. If I was looking at these low mo and no mow mixes, I would look for a high percentage of sheeps and hard fescue. I would look particularly for sheeps and hard fescue and less chewings and creeping red fest. Okay. Does Frank ever do in-person presentations for faculties and ground staff? Could he share no. his contact information? No, David does them. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah, no, David. Yes, I do, but no, <laughs> I won't. <laughs> of course I will. We have a variety of ways of getting our information out. Happy to do it, right, David? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. Um, what can we do to convince local commercial lawn companies to convert? Pay them more. <laughs>
you compensate for the difference in what they need to buy to have those electric mowers working. And you, and they can add that to the bottom line of their accounts, much like organic. Like, let's say you wanted a zero emissions yard. Landscape companies could offer zero emission yards, right? I would think. And you'd have to pay more for it. I, I, I promise you, if there's a demand and they're willing to pay, the industry will do it. Okay, let's do this one last one here. Let's say we got, what do you mean by brushless motor or mower? Okay, brushless motor has to do with motors that are driven by electric power that don't have brushes in them. That's my understanding of it. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently they're more efficient in converting the energy from the battery into power. Now, one of the things that the companies that are doing this well have figured out isn't the overall power demand, it's the how quickly it can get the energy out of the battery. Think about a chainsaw. You push a plug and you go, you know what I mean? You're at peak speed right away. And to do that in a little battery, you have to have some draining intelligence, you know, some energy pulling intelligence out of there. And the brushless motor is a more efficient way to pull that energy out and convert it into power. I never thought I would know any of this stuff, David. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm a biologist and I'm becoming a friggin' engineer. You're an engineer, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I have one other question for you, Frank. If you were a politician, all right. Let's say you were a politician and you were a decision maker in Albany. Would you push for the state offering a rebate or something to people to switch or some other program incentive? Why wouldn't we do that when I just built a, a small house on our property, a 750, my wife built a 750 square foot house on our property and we bought what's called a heat pump split. Mm. Right? You probably heard of these things. Yeah. If, I don't know what it cost. A $2,200 check showed up in the mail. Mm. And I was like, whoa, this is pretty good. And I know when I get solar, it's subsidized. And I know when I buy a plug in car, I get a rebate of sorts. Why wouldn't I do the same thing if I'm noticing that this is a contributor and I see my communities freaking out about it? If I was a politician, I would say, yeah, come on, let's go, turn them in. But what I, the reason I think it's important for me to talk about the outdoor power equipment industry, I don't want to liken them. It's probably, a, I'm not even going to do it. But they're a large industry organization that serves its members who are all generally gas-powered equipment people. Right. So, you know, whatever you do, it doesn't matter if you make rules and laws, if there isn't stuff for people to get that works, right? Mm -hmm. I think my opinion based on my research is the consumer blower and mower market and line trimmers is there. The biggest decision for the consumer is the platform. Once you start buying ego, you're going to buy all ego stuff because all the batteries fit in. You buy DeWalt, that's why DeWalt's been popular because a lot of people, Lowe's, DeWalt is the Lowe's equipment. So you had a drill. Oh, let me get a DeWalt mower. So some of the decisions you're going to make here are also based on platform. So yes, I would put a rebate thing because it's consistent with the other things that we're doing to help with this issue. And I would be really careful about how I made those selections. Yeah. So nice to see you both. Thank you very much for the time. David, I'm going to go. Yeah, thank you. Mercy, I'm going to go. Yeah. Bye now. This was fantastic. Thank Bye you. Bye, guys. Thank you.